practice mostly involves treating fairly common ailments. So when a patient presents with common symptoms, it can be challenging to recognize the point where common becomes uncommon. The following true story is a case in point. A 20-year-old college student visits her pediatrician after three days of throat pain, malaise, cough, and chills. Her vital signs are normal. The doctor notes tender enlarged lymph nodes in her neck, a red throat, and swollen tonsils. A rapid strep test is negative. The doctor performs a throat culture and advises her to drink fluids and take ibuprofen as needed. Most physicians would probably suspect viral pharyngitis, which usually manifests as a low-grade fever, a cough, and congestion. This was pre-COVID-19. The patient comes back the next day with worsening throat pain and difficulty swallowing. Her voice sounds muffled, though she can speak comfortably. A muffled, hot potato voice suggests upper airway obstruction. Asymmetric tonsillar enlargement may also indicate an abscess or infection. Let's review the patient's other symptoms and history. The patient has no fever and her vital signs are normal, but her tonsils and lymph nodes are still enlarged. She says her roommate recently had an upper respiratory infection. The patient isn't taking any long-term medications. She once had MRSA cellulitis, and as a child, she underwent a left carotid body resection for a benign tumor. She's had all her routine vaccinations. The patient could still have a strep infection despite the negative test, so the physician obtains a complete blood count and a test for mononucleosis, which also comes back negative. One dose of oral dexamethasone is prescribed, with acetaminophen as needed. Glucocorticoids like dexamethasone might be useful in some cases of sore throat, but are not generally recommended, as they may transiently reduce symptoms, but are associated with side effects. They may decrease host pathogen immune response, and they do not treat the underlying cause. The next day, the strep culture comes back negative. Serologic testing for Epstein-Barr virus IgG antibody to early IgG antigen is also negative. But EBV IgG and IgM and EBV IgG antibody nuclear antigen are positive. The results suggest that the patient likely had mono recently, but EBV serologies can be challenging to interpret. The results are more suggestive of a recent past infection than an acute one. One day later, the patient visits the ED with worsening throat pain, a still muffled voice, pain on swallowing, and shortness of breath. She is not in any obvious distress, though her heart rate is faster than normal. Her tonsils are still enlarged. She has painful swollen lymph nodes in her neck, but no limitation in neck movement. A liter of IV fluid brings her heart rate down. Blood work reveals a slightly decreased platelet count. Benzocaine spray is administered for her sore throat, along with another liter of IV fluid, and she is sent home as soon as she can swallow liquids. These findings are concerning. The elevated heart rate and decreased platelet count are alarm signs. At this point, further diagnostic evaluation and close observation are recommended. Three days later, the patient is back in the ED. She can't clear the secretions pooling in her respiratory tract and has a worsening cough, ongoing throat pain, and foul-smelling breath. She also reports three episodes of vomiting and she is anxious and appears critically ill. She has a fever and her heart rate and respirations are rapid. She notes pain on the left side of her neck when she turns her head to the right. Her throat appears swollen. These symptoms are concerning for upper airway obstruction, a life-threatening emergency. Without urgent intervention, airway compromise could progress and she may need to be intubated or even require an emergency tracheostomy. Further blood work reveals a slightly elevated white cell count, anemia, a low platelet count, signs of evolving kidney dysfunction, and metabolic acidosis. These findings are worrisome. She might be developing septic shock, another life-threatening emergency. The patient is given 1,000 milligrams of acetaminophen. Over the next two hours, she becomes increasingly agitated. Her temperature rises to dangerous levels, her heart rate increases, and her blood pressure falls. Her oxygen saturation is 97%. IV fluid briefly raises her blood pressure, but it soon drops again. She is given more IV fluid and IV ceftriaxone, a broad-spectrum antibiotic. Her lactate level suggests that her organs are not getting sufficient blood supply. A chest x-ray reveals abnormalities in the lungs consistent with fluid or solid material, most likely infection. 
Contrast-enhanced CT of the neck shows findings consistent with pus next to the tonsil and a blood clot in the left lingual vein at its juncture with the internal jugular vein. The patient is given broad-spectrum antibiotics. The patient has an infected blood clot in her internal jugular vein, or Lemierre syndrome. This is a rare condition, often preceded by bacterial pharyngitis and dental infections, though this patient did not have evidence of either. Less commonly, it may be triggered by infectious mononucleosis. Variants of Lemierre syndrome can affect any of the large venous structures of the face, and infection can spread to the surrounding facial structures. High-grade fever, neck pain, and respiratory distress are typical presenting symptoms of this syndrome, which can also lead to infected blood clots obstructing a blood vessel, infiltrates in the lungs, lung abscess, sepsis, septic arthritis, and even bone infection. The patient is transferred to the ICU and put on supplementary oxygen. She begins to breathe comfortably, though her heart rate remains rapid and her blood oxygenation level below normal. She is given three new antibiotics. Nasal pharyngeal endoscopy reveals a fullness of the tonsils that's greater on the left than the right, and dexamethasone is administered. CT angiography reveals seeding of bacteria to the lungs. There are also small pockets of air in the right clavicle. On the patient's second day in the ICU, anaerobic cultures grow gram-negative bacilli, and she has pain in her right clavicle. Many bacterial agents can cause Lemierre's disease, including MRSA and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Here, the gram-negative rods are most likely F. necroforum, which produces hydrogen sulfide gas and is a known cause of emphysematous osteomyelitis. The antibiotic regimen is narrowed, and damaged tissue is surgically removed to control the source of infection. Results of blood cultures confirm F. necroforum. The patient's pain abates after surgery, and she's discharged after eight days. But antibiotic treatment continues for 12 more weeks. One month post-op, the patient still has clavicular pain, but she has otherwise recovered. The patient's swollen glands and sore throat were presumed to be caused by mono, but the serology results didn't show acute mononucleosis. She presented several times with worsening symptoms before additional diagnostic evaluation was performed, resulting in a delayed diagnosis. Unfortunately, in the interim, she had substantial clinical deterioration and experienced complications. Common symptoms usually indicate a common problem, but we need to have an early index of suspicion for a more serious condition when typical cases evolve atypically. Fortunately, the vast majority of sore throats are not serious. <laughs>